Hello everyone, I'm Evan Baker and welcome to Ice Knight Gaming, where skill is inconsequential. Today we have another list video for you, and on today's episode we are going to be going over my top 10 favorite Dungeons & Dragons monsters. Uh, before we begin, I want to give a big thank you to all of my amazing patrons for their incredible generosity. More about how you can support the channel at the end of this episode. But for now, we've got a lot to cover today, so let's get to it. Now before we get into this, I just want to point out, uh, while this is a top 10, the monsters on this list are not in any particular order. Number 10 is not my least favorite, number 1 is not my most favorite. Basically, the list is made up of the order in which I thought of these monsters. So, we're going to get right into it, though, with our number 10. So, coming in at number 10, we have Cobalt. Uh, the Cobalt is probably one of the first monsters that a party starting at level 1 through 3 will encounter. And from personal experience, I can say they are more than meets the eye. These craven, reptilian humanoids are experts at making traps, digging tunnels, and actually, they can be very dangerous in large groups. The lowest cobalt, which is basically the basic cobalt, is a lowly CR 1 8, but there are some that are as high as a CR 3. So from lowest to highest, you have uh, your basic cobalt, ice wind cobalts, and Ice Wind Cobalt Zombies, which all share CR 1 8. Uh, then you have Winged Cobalts and Cobalt Inventors, which are a CR 1 quarter. Uh, next you have Cobalt Scale Sorcerers and Cobalt Dragon Shields, which are a CR 1. And then finally you have Cobalt Vampire Spawns at a CR 3. Now, while usually used for low-level parties, I can definitely see myself using these later on as minions in a fight against, say, like a red or a black dragon. Number nine, we have the Gelatinous Cube. Now, I know there are several people who are probably getting a little PTSD from this entry on my list. Uh, but these transparent ooze monsters at a CR2 are not really anything to write home about, unless your DM has a habit of placing them directly in a hallway and hopes that your perception isn't high enough to see it before you walk face first into it. They have a low armor class, but a fairly high hit point pool, making them ideal for a trap or a minor annoyance uh, of an obstacle to overcome. Uh, the most dangerous thing about a gelatinous cube is that it's virtually invisible when it's not moving, and that it also deals high acid damage to anyone who gets engulfed by it. Now, I have personally had the pleasure of running exactly one of these a long time ago, but ever since then I've always wanted to find a reason to use it again. Next on our list at number 8 is the Rust Monster. Now with a CR 1 half, the Rust Monster isn't exactly an imposing monster, except if your party faces it when they have no magical weapons or armor because of the effects that the Rust Monster can have on those items. Uh, any non-magical weapon made of metal that hits the Rust Monster corrodes after dealing its damage. This causes the weapon to take a permanent and cumulative Nega 1 penalty to damage rolls. So if that penalty drops to negative 5, the weapon is destroyed. Non-magical ammunition made of metal that hits the rust monster is destroyed after it deals its damage. Uh, with metal armor or shields, the rust monster reduces the AC bonus of armor whenever it touches it. Uh, if the armor is reduced to an armor class of 10 or a metal shield drops to a plus 0 armor class bonus, they are also destroyed. So when I first started playing Dungeons and Dragons many years ago, there was a solo adventure in what I often refer to as the original Red Box, uh, which featured a solo dungeon that there was a rust monster living in. Uh, and on the very first playthrough 
of that adventure. I lost all of my metal equipment two separate times just because of bad rolls. But that challenge actually is what made me really enjoy Dungeons and Dragons. And, you know, I've been playing ever since. So you might actually say that the Rust Monster was instrumental in, you know, bringing me into the hobby. At number seven, we have Green Hag. Uh, the Green Hag is the weakest of the Hag line, but that doesn't diminish her usefulness, both as an enemy and actually as just a general NPC. The Green Hag can disguise herself using illusionary appearance, which realistically has a lot of applications in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, the Green Hag can also turn completely invisible, and she leaves no trace of her presence as she moves and can only be tracked by magical means, which allows her to either escape to fight another day or set up an ambush. Now, in addition, there are also spellcasters, albeit they only have a few cantrips at their disposal. But the beauty of Dungeons and Dragons is if you don't like the cantrips, you can always switch those up and give the green hag some other cantrip that she can use uh, now, I would probably use the Green Hag as either a quest giver in her disguised form or use her as a mid-boss and give her some minions, like maybe some undead or crawling claws or scarecrows. Coming in at number six, we have the Vampire. I feel like when you think of vampires in Dungeons and Dragons, the first name that comes to mind is Strahd von Zarovich, who's quite possibly the most noteworthy vampire in D&D, you know, right up along other fictional vampires like Dracula himself. Now, while I've never really liked undead in movies or TV shows, Strahd has a special place in my heart because I remember reading a Choose Your Own Adventure book that featured Strahd and introduced me to Castle Ravenloft, Barovia, and of course the Sun Sword, which is a magical sword that once belonged to Strahd's brother Sergei. Uh, you know, I also read a book called I Strahd, which is like a memoir that is supposed to kind of explain why Strahd is the Lord of Barovia, why the land itself seems to rise up against anybody who challenges him. Uh, I've always wanted to play Curse of Strahd, if for no other reason than to try to claim the Sun Sword and face Strahd himself. Coming in at number five, we have Mind Flayer. So the Mind Flayer is actually a monster that I really liked before I even knew it was from Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, the first Mind Flayers I ever saw were in Final Fantasy I. Uh, now originally they were called uh, Wizards and Sorcerers. Uh, uh, then they changed it in later versions of the game so that they were Pisco Demons and then the Mind Flayer was a upgraded version of a Pisco Demon. Uh, now, in Dungeons and Dragons, they have a powerful Mind Blast attack that can stun you. Uh, they can devour the brain of characters who are reduced to zero HP while grappled, uh, which they actually do as part of their tentacle attack, and their spellcasters. Now, they have a lot of psychic spells, you know, stuff like that, but just like I mentioned with the Green Hag, you know, if you don't like the spells that they've got, you know, you're the dungeon master. Change up the spells. Take something that you would never use, you know, and put in something that would at least be, you know, a little more, you know, useful. Just, you know, try to try to keep it with a theme, I guess. Uh, you know, but the Mind Flayer is actually a challenging enemy at CR7. And this is especially true if it's accompanied by, like, a group of intellect devourers. Coming in at number four, we have the Cadaver Collector. So picture a hulking machine surrounded by a patchwork of discarded weapons and armor with large spikes all over it. Well, you don't actually have to picture that because I have a picture of it right there for you. 
but now picture that it wanders the fields of battle, grabbing dead bodies and impaling them upon these spikes, wandering aimlessly unless threatened. I remember hearing about this creature once. Then I also had the pleasure of facing it in combat. And it was a bit of an adventure in itself, to be sure. At an imposing CR-14, the Cadaver Collector is a force of nature that you definitely don't want to be on the bad side of for any reason. Coming in at number three, we have the Aboleth. Uh, now picture a creature that is almost beyond imagination. A large amphibious creature with three red eyes that run vertically down its head, strong psychic powers, and not one but two different abilities that cast uh, basically two separate diseases. Uh, one of them, uh, if you get close enough to the aboleth in the water, it'll cause a disease that turns your skin translucent and slimy and you basically have to stay in the water. Uh, or you can't, um, and I, I, I don't remember it now, I forgot to write it down, but I believe that that disease actually makes it impossible for you to recover health unless it's, uh, you know, unless you can get rid of it. Uh, the other uh, disease actually makes it so that you cannot breathe above water. You have to breathe, you can only breathe underwater. Uh, you know, the Aboleth uh, also has the ability to enslave those in the vicinity, and it can telepathically communicate with those up to a, a actually up to quite a distance. Um, and of course, you know, an Aboleth has several lair actions at their disposal as well. They're just an all around creepy but awesome looking monster. You know, and, you know, because of that, I actually like using an Aboleth as like a mid level boss encounter personally. Coming in at number two, we have red dragons. So of all the dragons, I really had to go with the fire breathing monster that is a red dragon. Even when these are just wormlings, they're imposing and powerful. Now their breath weapon can easily knock out the unprepared. Now at the apex of this is the ancient red dragon. It's a CR-24 gargantuan dragon with strength to match it. Uh, now, while red dragons can range from CR-4 to CR-24, every version is a powerful foe. Every version, you know, will definitely leave a lasting impression on the party if, you know, sent after the party at a, you know, a, an appropriate level. You don't want to overpower the party, but you also want, don't want you know, the red dragon to, you know, be a pushover. Now, I draw a lot of inspiration from red dragons, you know, for both D&D &D and my personal writing. And actually, that ties us in to our next monster. At number one, we have the Lich. The monster that tops this list, albeit, as I said, this list is not actually from worst to best, but a general order. Even still, the Lich is a master spellcrafter who underwent a dark ritual to become what it is, a powerful boss level monster. While the Lich actually has low hit points in comparison to other monsters of CR 21, it can cast spells all the way up to 9th level to make up for this. And while it has some very impressive spells in its wheelhouse, the fact that it has the spell slots also means you can customize the Lich in virtually any way you want. If you don't like some of the spells that it has, give it some other spells. Simple. I think that with regard to the Lich, like the Red Dragon, I draw inspiration from it for all my writing. But at the end of the day, a nearly immortal spellcaster who has possibly transcended ages is just a really cool concept. Tying into the fact that if you don't destroy its flattery, I think I pronounced that right, uh, you know, the, the Lich comes back to life after a certain number of days and, you know, well, now you've basically just aggravated it. You know, now, now it's just mad. You know, so it, it, it's probably going to come after you at that point. 
you know, and that, and that just adds to the story, adds good role play, you know, you know, maybe the Lich can be there, can be your BBEG, but if the party forgets to find that phylactery, you know, oops. That about does it for today's episode. Uh, the videos I create on my channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of my Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work I do here on YouTube, please consider supporting the channel by following the link in the description below. If you're new to the channel, please remember to hit the subscribe button. I upload new videos every Sunday and Wednesday, so also remember to turn on your notifications so you never miss an update. Don't forget to hit the like button and let me know some of your favorite monsters down in the comments. If I get enough, I might do a commenter's edition of this list. As always, thank you for watching and I'll see you next episode.